How many, just out of curiosity when we start, how many people here use more than one Ruby? Okay, pretty much, pretty much everybody. How many people have actually ever tried Maglev? Okay, a handful. So we'll get started. So back in uh, Valentine's Day in 2008, when we started implementing uh, Maglev, that, that was the time uh, Avi Bryant convinced me that this was like a really easy thing to do, that the object models were similar. And you know, 100 days later, uh, Avi and some guys that I, uh, you know, at our site had WebRick running and they were running yard benchmarks. We thought, well, surely, yeah, this is really is pretty easy. And uh, then we discovered that we had only explored the tip of the iceberg. And certainly, there was no such thing as the free lunch that Avi had kind of promised. However, uh, there might be, OK, that's not going to work. However, there might be a free pony. And even if the pony's not obvious, just uh, kind of like this Bev Sullivan uh, picture, but in a recent blog post, uh, Rob Heitman wrote, the real reason to play with Maglev is the free pony. And what he was talking about was the persistence layer in Maglev. And so before Peter gets to the part talking about how difficult it was getting past this free lunch thing, I'd like to explain a little bit about Maglev's persistent cache. I, I kind of wanted to talk about other you know, more significant things, maybe like uh, profilers and debuggers and object logs and uh, statistics displayers and all that stuff. But it really, none of that matters until you get persistence done. And we call it a persistent, we used to call it a persistent cache. I think we quit doing that. But I, I think I want to go back to that terminology because MacLab objects have the same structure in memory and on disk so that when you persist something to disk, it's just a straight write. There's no marshalling, uh, no object relational mapping. And all the, and when you get it into the cache, then any MacLab VM running on the same uh, system, either the same machine or another machine, but in the same fabric, uh, I'll have access to the shared memory to get fast access. So I think I'll maybe start you know, using the term cache again. So I want to go back to RailsConf 2008. Uh, Avi Bryant used uh, his familiar magic trick to demo MAGA persistence. He pulled the rabbit uh, put into a hat in one Ruby VM out of the hat in a separate Ruby VM. And, but, you know, he didn't really explain how he did it. He just showed it, showed he had nothing up his sleeves, but he didn't explain it. So I thought today I would be like those uh, magicians who uh, rat on other magicians, and I'd show you kind of what was going on behind the curtain. So, like all hat tricks, it just starts out with a simple, ordinary Ruby hat. I mean, there's nothing here. Uh, initialize this to an empty array. You can put things in it and ask its size. There's no Ruby magic. There's no Maglev magic here. Just standard Ruby stuff. Works fine in MRI. Uh, and then the rabbit's even simpler. It's only got one method. It's got an inspect method. And you kind of have to squeeze the rabbit down so it fits into this tiny space so we can sneak it into the hat. But when it pops out of the hat, you can see that indeed it is a bunny rabbit. And that's what Avi showed at RailsConf. But I'm going to talk a bit about three of the devices in MagLab that make that possible. Uh, and then I'll show you a quick demo to show that it actually works. So the first thing is, first kind of incantation that makes this work kind of like abracadabra is MagLab persistent do. And this provides a way to load classes that then become persistent in MagLab and are available to other uh, images. And you know, without persistence, the bunny and even the hat would kind of go away as soon as I quit running my VM. So the next trick up our sleeve is called Maglev Commit Transaction. It's got an evil twin called Maglev Abort Transaction, but these basically begin and end any of the magic tricks. Not possible to transfer a bunny from one hat to another without committing the transaction first. And Maglev transactions, although we call it a cache, it really is database-like. Maglev transactions have acid properties, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And we'll actually demonstrate that in a minute when I get to the live, uh, live part of this. 
So the third thing I want to talk about is maglev persistent root. This is the cage where we keep the bunny in between tricks. We make sure it doesn't get lost. All it is, basically, it's a hash that provides a convenient place to hang a Ruby object that you want to stick around. And persistence is by reachability. So anything that you attach in this hash, you can get to that object, you can get to any object connected to that object. When everything's totally disconnected from the persistent root, it'll get garbage collected. Uh, and you can put any kind of object you want in here. I mean, trees, graphs, key-value pairs, you can put blocks, props, lambdas. It doesn't matter. And I was talking to one of my users uh, last week, because it's kind of hard to explain why even people would want to do this. But he said, you know, after about a month of using this, I kind of realized he said, I wasn't, it was what I wasn't doing rather than what I was doing that was interesting. He said, he says, I just wasn't able to think about persistence anymore. Anything I wanted to have later, I just kind of stuck it in there. And then I realized I wasn't thinking about the data anymore. So we think that's the cool part. Uh, but the next thing, so if we look at, at you know, how we turn that simple Ruby hat into a kind of magic hat using these tricks, this is what we do. I mean, basically, we do a maglev persistent do. We load the hat in the rabbit, which is going to load those classes into the persistent image. Uh, we create uh, a hat. That's the first thing the magician's going to do is create a new hat and commit that transaction. And this will print, you know, kind of for diagnostic purposes here, it'll print that we've created an empty app, uh, which we could delete, but we'll leave it there for purposes of demo. Uh, then the magician would show the audience that the hat is empty. You know. uh, then the magician's assistant or the magician, by some magic, is going to put uh, a new rabbit into the hat. Then we go back and show that the rabbit is in the hat, and then that's the end of the magic trick. However, what we're going to do, being the magician who wants to expose stuff, we're going to persist a proc in the system uh, that's going to allow us to look at persistent, this persistent root and see what's in there. And it's fairly simple. It's just a proc. Uh, aborts a transaction, so we make sure we've got the most current state. And then we just look at either the persistent root or a key that we pass in. doesn't matter. Uh, and so we're going to store this as a, you know, as a proc uh, in the database. I think it's probably very difficult to store a proc in MySQL. Uh, you can store the string that represents a proc, but it's not really a proc. So let's see. I'm going to switch to a screen where I can run this live for a minute. Let's see what we can do. Let's see if I can make this work. Okay. So I can see it. Ah, okay. So first thing we're going to do is I'm going to uh, fire up IRB and uh, turn that proc into a local variable. So I'm going to have to type quite so much, and we're going to execute that proc, and we're going to see. There's nothing in the hat but the proc, so the magician is not even started yet. So let's see. Let's go over to the magician, and what's the magician going to do? Uh, first thing the magician is going to do is going to create the hat. Okay, and we can go back over here, and we can peek again. And we can see that, yeah, in the persistent root, we've now got the prop. We also have the hat. And you can see that the hat is empty. So the magician is then going to, uh, let's see, he didn't want to do that again. Magician's going to show that the hat is empty as well. Now, about this time, the assistant is going to go over here. Uh, and add the rabbit to the hat. Now let's go back to, uh, let's go over here first where we can see, and let's peek before the magician, so we're behind stage, and we can see that, yeah, we now have the hat, and the hat has the rabbit in it. So the magician then shows the hat contents, voila, and the rabbit is there. 
All of these, anytime I execute one of these, I'm firing up a new VM and just executing from scratch. I don't really need to have the, uh, uh, I don't really need to have separate windows for these, but I think it, it, it shows better that they are actually separate VMs. So, now, the assistant's going to add another hat, another hat, another rabbit to the hat. But I tell you what let's do, let's mess with their minds a bit. Okay, guess it doesn't take, yeah, I guess with the caps lock key, that doesn't work. I don't know, lowercase exit. Uh, So we've got a maglev server out there running on, uh, its PID is 3336, so let's kill it. So this is gonna completely screw up the magician. I mean, we can look here and do status again, and you can see maglev's not even running. So the magician goes out here to show the second rabbit, voila. He gets the maglev server is not running. He makes his apologies. Starts it up again. And here, I'll clear the screen because I know it's down at the bottom. Let's see, command K. Does the show hat contents. And now both wrap-ups are there. Even after we kill the system, start up completely separate VMs. Because it's not just the data that's the rabbit. The class is there, the proc is there, everything that we use is there. Now, but you might ask, where's the pony? I didn't see a pony, right? Well, let's ask the assistant. Let's go back over to the assistant, and let's let the assistant show the hat contents. Voila, there's the pony. Snuck that in while nobody was looking. So I'm going to let Peter talk about the more interesting part of things. So, oh, and I should I should mention though for anybody uh, the codes on Maglev, uh, codes on Maglev, codes on GitHub Maglev. Uh, you can clone it. You can load it with RBM. The, the Maglev part is all MIT licensed. Uh, you know, uh, fork it, make changes to it, send us pull requests, whatever. Please uh, follow us on Twitter. There's a website at maglab.gemstone.com, but I update it so rarely I hate to even talk about it. And uh, I'll let Peter talk about the more fun stuff. Uh, Mont covered a bit about the free lunch, but I'm going to talk about the technical details of it. And first, I want to run through some of the um, areas where Maglab does it. The free lunch was sold to us. What are some of the features between Smalltalk and Ruby that, that really look like they, they really match up well? So if you talk about dynamic languages, uh, Smalltalk is definitely a dynamic language, and so is Ruby. So that, that, was, that was a good match. What about objects? Well, Smalltalk, everything's an object, and it's the same thing with Ruby. Everything's an object. What about blocks? Smalltalk, they have blocks all over the place. Ruby, yes. Not only do we have blocks, we have procs and lambdas as well. So that's already looking like a straight slam dunk there. Metaprogramming, Smalltalk has metaprogramming. In fact, that's how you make, class, uh, how you make classes. You send messages to other classes to tell them to subclass themselves. All, all, the, all that stuff is really done through metaprogramming. Um, in Ruby, same thing. Meta classes, Smalltalk has them built in. Ruby, well, you got something called singletons and people call them meta classes, so maybe that's the same thing. I don't know. <laughs> so, we, uh, so, we, so we go on. So obviously, it's going to be a real simple case to get Ruby to run right on Magla. They're, they're virtually identical. Smalltalk Gemstone, and now we've been taught by VMware, but has a Smalltalk VM. It's fast, 64-bit, has built-in object persistence, that Monty just showed that. It's proven in the industry, a uh, lot of finance, banks, transport. A lot of people run you know, business critical apps 24 by 7 on the Smalltalk VM with the object persistence. Um, so it should be real simple for, for Gemstone to get this uh, thing up and running. Well, I had a professor in history who um, said that really the similarities are rarely as interesting as the differences. And so I'm going to talk about some of the few of the differences between Ruby and Smalltalk that sort of paid my lunch for the last couple of years. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Eh? 
The problem was, when we were trying to get Rails to run, uh, we finally got it running, but it took five minutes from the time I typed Rails server to the time I got that little prompt that said, listening on port, you know, 1234. That's, that's really not gonna, gonna fly. Once you get over your initial shock with that, you wanna ask, well, why? Why, why, why does it take so long? So, um, poke around, do some little performance analysis and everything, and what I find out is that the send sites cache is being invalidated thousands of times in booting up Rails. It's actually tens of thousands of times. So that's, that's, that's definitely going to be a, a, a problem. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what a send site is and what, what, why you might want to cache something in it, and then we'll talk about uh, what we did to fix that. Well, um, a send site is basically wherever a message is sent. It, the name comes from the fact that when you send a message, there's a byte code that's uh, run that means send something rather. Send sites are wherever you send a message. There we're sending each, the message each to an array. There we're sending message inspect to whatever is in X. And there we have a uh, send of the message put S to the implicit top level object. Each one of those send sites is, corresponds to a byte code. So we have two bytes in that highlighted little bit of code there that we're going to look at. We have a uh, inspect uh, send byte code and a send self. And each of those will have a send site cache. And the thing that can't gets put into a send site cache is the mapping between the receiver's class and the actual method that we want to implement. Ruby is a dynamic language, and we don't know ahead of time what actual concrete method we're going to do. And that can change from moment to moment as you do metaprogramming and all these other things. So um, that's the thing that we want to cache in there. And the reason why we want to cache it is it takes a lot of time to crawl around the inheritance hierarchy, find the right method, and then invoke it. And so we want to cache that lookup whenever we can. So I'm going to do a quick little run through this, this little, that little bit of highlighted code and uh, watch how the, the send site cache is built up. So when we start the loop, the, we're assuming that all of our send site caches are empty. Um, and we, the first time through the loop, x is a string. So we uh, look down at the send byte code, and there's nothing in the send site cache. So we have to go crawl around the hierarchy. We go look in the class, the single link class. We go look, look in the class, look in the Mexican modules. Eventually, we find it. We find that when you have a string, the right method is the one in string. And so that's the, the, the concrete uh, method that we put into the send site cache. So that's fine. Now we're going to go do our second um, put s, whoops, do our second put a, uh, message send, which we want to put s. And that's a, the implicit top level object, which is a, a, an instance of object. And again, the send site cache is empty, so we've got to call around the hierarchy again and try and find the right concrete method to actually put in that send site cache. So we spend a lot of time doing that, and we finally find out that actually this one comes out of kernel, because kernels, this is where put s is, it's a, it's a module mixed into object. And so we can finally put that in our send site cache and go off and execute the method. Now we're going the second time through the loop, and x is a symbol this time. So we go to our first send byte code, and again, we have something in the send site cache, but it's not the right thing. We have the receiver this time is a symbol, not a string, so we have to go crawl around the hierarchy, uh, find out the right method, and it turns out it's symbol, has its own version of inspect, and we put that in there, and then we uh, invoke that and go on. So now we're going to try and implement uh, to send for put s. It's the same object. And we've already got, so we get a send site cache hit this time. We already have the mapping from object to the actual concrete method that we're going to be um, invoking. And so we can directly call that method and we save all that stuff. We don't have to go crawling around the hierarchy. So then the third time through that, that, that loop, uh, the, the cache is all warmed up and we just go flying through. We don't have to do any crawling around uh, looking for methods. So the question is, what, what, what invalidates a cache? Why would, what, what, what would Rails be doing that would keep on our send site caches? Well, anything that messes with 
the hierarchy and that would change what method we would find if we did the lookup again. So if you define a new method, that method might get inserted somewhere in the hierarchy. And if we start the method lookup again from, that, from the receiver's class all the way up, we might find that new method. And so that might be something that can invalidate a sense site cache. Uh, removing a method, likewise, we might have a, a method that's cached, and we can, um, if you remove a method, that that could we might be actually calling a method that no longer exists in, in, in the system. So that's something else. Aliasing a method, very similar to defining a new one. Um, you can redefine a method. The, um, the actual class that you find the method in won't, may not change, but the contents of that method, it's a brand new method, even though it's named the same and it's in the same class, uh, that, that still also can blow a cache. And any change in the hierarchy, you start mixing in new modules or, or whatever, and that can also change the type of method. So, what was Rails doing when uh, it was coming up and taking five minutes, five minutes for it to load? Well, basically it was writing code, and I did a quick little count, and there were at least 227 defined methods, there was uh, 182 alias methods, 520 after readers, after writers, and there was, uh, there was a lot of other stuff that it was doing. So Rails is writing a lot of code and mucking with the hierarchy a lot when it, when it comes up. And that was really blowing our send site caches. But that's still not the whole story because you know, it took five minutes for maglev, but other VMs have send site caches. Uh, but they wrote, they boot Rails much quicker than five minutes. So there's still something else going on in the system that I didn't didn't quite understand. Why why we why that would so the problem is Magma was doing explicit invalidation of the caches. And what does that mean? Well, it means basically, this is pseudocode, but for every method in the entire system. Then for every send site in that method, <laughs> lovingly scrape it clean, paint it new, and go on to the next one. So we were spending all of our time in this kind of brain dead stupid loop. Um, so what was our solution? Now I'm gonna go through the solution kind of quickly because it's not really the interesting part of this thing. We decided to go with lazy invalidation of send site caches. We don't need to blow every single one every single time explicitly. Um, what, that, what that involves is the VM now has a serial number, we call it the serial number, and each send site cache gets its own serial number as well. If the serial number of the send site cache matches the VM serial number, the cache is good and we can, we can use the contents of, those, of that cache. If, however, like in this up in the foot S1, the send site serial number, 873, is different than the VM serial number, then we know that that particular cache is invalidated and we'll have to, we'll, we'll clean it up at the point we, we run that and uh, update it with new information. Um, to invalidate a send site cache, all we have to do is increment the number. It's a it's pretty uh, simple operation. But what that does is when we come to the next time and do a send inspect, we take a look at its send site cache and it's invalid now. One, two, three, four is not equal to one, two, three, five. And so if that cache is invalidated, we blow it and we have to go refill it all up again. And likewise with that. That's not it. In addition to just um, having sense like caches themselves maintain a serial number, the real effort is in the method lookup. So we also have what's called a method lookup cache. Because we can cache the results of looking fine of mapping string class maps to this particular method, that can be used by several send sites uh, throughout the system because each time you send 2s or whatever to a string, you can make, make use of that uh, method lookup cache. So we, we have a, another layer of caching called the method lookup cache. And we also maintain a list of recently changed method names, so selectors, uh, so that we know that if the only methods that have been, that have been mucked with recently are to us and inspect. Well, if you're calling hash or any other method, we don't really, even though sense site cache is invalid, is invalid by the serial number check, we know that we haven't changed that name, so, so we're okay uh, without that. So we have basically three layers of caching and they all get blown at different levels and 
it works a lot better. So with that solution, uh, Rails now loads in under 15 seconds, and you can get faster than that with a warm page cache. That was, that was one problem we had. But I still haven't gotten to the really interesting question, I think, with this particular example. And that was, why was the old code, the explicit CS101-ish iterate to everything explicitly, why was that answer acceptable to small talkers? We obviously saw it was a huge impact in trying to load Rails. Well, the answer is because it's probably the right trade-off if you're running Smalltalk. And uh, why is that? Well, the way Smalltalk approaches programming, they simply didn't run into this problem. Smalltalk was like the language of, uh, or maybe it was self, I get uh, confused. It's actually, the, they developed the sense I caches for, so they weren't concerned about performance, but they don't, they, uh, their use of the Gemstone VM was such that explicitly invalidating the caches was not a big problem. And, and why, is, why is that? Well, one thing is, in Smalltalk, they prefer metadata to metaprogramming. So you're not going to see an OR, like the, the best known, I guess, Smalltalk ORM is something called Glorp. They don't do metaprogramming, they create metadata. They have a set of standard classes that represent fields and tables and rows and all that sort of stuff. But then they, when they examine your, uh, your particular database schema, they create a, bun a, a bunch of instances of that object that reflect that structure. So it's done in, in metadata, not in writing new code. But even when they do do metaprogramming, um, it's only done typically once, or maybe once per migration, because they have the ability to save the results of that metaprogramming in the image. So if they do do metaprogramming, it's done in some developers at a particular time, like Tuesday afternoon, that developer's sense I caches were blown. But once that, that guy paid his cost, nobody else has to pay that cost because that code, all those changes are saved in the image and are ready for uh, anybody, any other VM that fires up will automatically get all that stuff without having to blow the send site caches. So it's a difference in um, culture and approaches and the tools that uh, allow, um, allow them to do that. Whereas if you look at the Ruby side of things, Ruby, this I'm making, I don't know, maybe too bold a statement here, but Ruby frameworks tend to prefer metaprogramming to metadata. That doesn't mean there's no metadata. People throw out YAML files here and there and there's config files and all that. But there's a, there's a lot of more emphasis on the metaprogramming than on, say, doing things through metadata. And furthermore, that metaprogramming happens every time any VM boots. Every time any Rails VMs boot, you, uh, you, you load up uh, Ruby, you, you run through Rails, you do all that configuring of object and hash and everything else that they do. Uh, that happens every single time you boot. Whereas in, in the small talk thing, it do doesn't. And of course, if you use Maglev, you also have the option of persisting all that stuff to change and not having to incur the uh, runtime costs. So the factors were that small talk can save, image can save objects, and Ruby really just has the fewer options. Um, I'm going to skip over the REE one and go to problem two. So another problem we knew, that the, so the first problem we talked about was something kind of blindsided us. We weren't expecting that when we were starting to implement Maglev. This other, the second problem I'm going to talk about is uh, one where we actually did know about before we started Maglev. And that's a variable number of arguments. In Smalltalk, which the VM was originally designed for, there's a fixed number of parameters per method, and that never changes. Ruby, on the other hand, has optional parameters, it has splat args, you know, there's that implicit block that may or may not be passed into a method. And um, so those are, so Ruby has this issue, of how do you communicate the number of parameters that a, that a call side is actually passing to a method? And we have to have some sort of protocol for matching those, those two things up. In Smalltalk, it's encoded in the method name. It's either syntactically impossible to send the wrong number of arguments, or you're going to get a message, um, not understood error. So here's a bit of small talk. 
assume favorite color is a, is a hash, it's a, in small talk we call a dictionary. The name of this method that we're sending is at colon put colon. And then the arguments go, we go at right after the keywords there. So we're, we're, putting, we're putting into the uh, hash, we're putting the entry that Fred likes red. You can't pass the incorrect number of arguments there. <coughs> you can try, you can, you can try not to pass something, but the compiler won't let you get past that. That's a syntax error. So you can't compile that method. Uh, if you try and add, sneak in an extra argument, well, number one, you have to come up with a, a new keyword for that. And then you're not, you know, hash doesn't have, or dictionary doesn't have a method called at colon, put colon, no colon. So that's gonna be a method not understood, so there's no danger there. You can try hack, attaching something to the end of the message, but uh, that's, that's legal syntax, and what will happen is the at colon put will be called, and the result of that call will be, the VM will try and send the message xxx to that, and we will find message xxx in the blue object. So you basically can't really send the wrong number of arguments. In Ruby, of course, it's not encoded in the name and it's really easy. You have a def method A, it's easy to get a mess match. That will work fine, we're passing, <coughs> it's defined with one argument, we're passing one argument. That's a method with no parameters, that's syntactically correct. We're gonna find the right method, but we're gonna get an argument error there. Likewise, if we send a ton of arguments, we're also gonna get an argument error. <coughs> So, um, what do we do about it? Well, it's, we have to, well, to understand the solution, we're gonna take a quick look at the actual stack frames and how things get sent. So briefly from this code, this is a stack frame when we're calling from a method into another one. Below, the bottom third of that is set up by the calling code when you, um, before transfer of control is done. That middle part is, over bookkeeping that's set up by the uh, uh, send bytecode in the top part is where the target method takes over. So a simple example, we have a method m that simply returns whatever you pass it in, and then down below that we have an invocation of that method. At the call site, when we invoke that method, what we're gonna do is, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna push the receiver of the object onto the stack, so that goes on the bottom of the stack. In our case, it's um, actually, it's not M, that's a, that's a typo. It's gonna be the top level object. Uh, the next thing we're gonna push is the one argument we're gonna send, and we're, since we're sending 10, that gets pushed onto the stack. So at this point, we have, um, below the line is what was set up before we do the send call. The send bytecode is basically gonna keep track, uh, push the instruction pointer that we're gonna to return to. It's gonna push the saved frame pointer so we can get back to the previous stack frame. It's gonna push, and then it's gonna actually look up and actually find the method using all the send site caches and everything that we talked about earlier. And then it's going to um, push that code pointer onto the top of the stack. At this point, we're ready to transfer control to the calling method. So here's the, at the bottom there, we see the stack as the uh, calling method is gonna receive it. And in this example, I'm gonna say that the caller and the call agree on the number of parameters. So that um, what the compiler emits when it's, when it's compiling this that MA method is it's going to, it already knows the offsets in the stack frame for where all the arguments are passed. Uh, we always know that the last parameter that's passed is gonna be at the frame pointer plus 16. So that, that offset is already calculated at compile time and put into the method. And likewise, the offset for the receiver on the stack is also calculated at compile time, and that offset is, is put in directly into the method. So we, um, so we have all those things um, pre-calculated, and there's no real protocol within the stack. We don't push like the number of arms we're, we're passing or anything like that. If the caller and target disagree on the number, for instance, we have a definition where we have an optional parameter, so it's legal to, to call M10. Well, if you take a look at the frame pointer plus 16, you go down and look at our actual frame, we have um, where, it thinks our, where it thinks B is, the calling method, the target method thinks that the argument B should be the frame pointer plus 16. Well, the calling method shoved A, the parameter A there. So we're already in trouble there. And likewise, the 
the call the target method thinks that the argument A should be at frame pointer plus 24, but that's where the receiver was pushed in our actual frame there at the bottom. And then when we look at the receiver, we don't know what we're going to get because it's going to be whatever happened to be at the top of the stack when things happen. So that's, that's kind of the issue we had. Smalltalk never ran into this problem because there was never any disagreement between what you're calling and what, what you ended up with. But we had to come up with something for Ruby. So the solution we did, we wanted to um, not really mess with the VM internals and muck with all that code. We also didn't want to really impose a runtime cost on Smalltalk because they already had a really efficient implicit protocol. So we um, decided to leverage the Smalltalk naming convention and we came up with this idea of bridge methods. <coughs> Involves no VM changes. So how does that work? Well, compile time, here we have a method with, uh, with, with two parameters, well, a, a fixed parameter and an optional parameter. And that actually compiles to 16 methods. You notice their, their name's kind of weird. And so what we do is we actually make these methods, these are called bridge methods. Um, the colons <coughs> denote a parameter. Star denotes that we're passing a splat args. And ampersand denotes that we're passing in the, uh, the block there. You notice that one purple one over there was m colon colon. That's the actual real method that we're compiling because our, our current method here has two parameters. So we're going to, that's where we're going to actually put the real code. So what's in all of these other things? Well, those are, called, those are bridge methods. We'll take a quick look at what's happening. So that's our method. Suppose we're going to send a, something that matches up. We're going to send, we, we define a method that takes two parameters and we're passing two parameters. What we're actually going to do is we're going to do a send of m colon colon, which is going to line up to that real method that we compiled, and we just go straight in, all the arguments will line up, and we, we execute code. <coughs> but if we only pass one, and, and this, this method is allowed to pass one, and we should have an implicit v equals 10. So we're going to send the, the when, at the call site, we're going to be sending the message m colon, denoting a one arg thing. And that method is implemented as a bridge method that simply allocates the proper amount of space on the stack and then goes ahead and calls the real method m colon colon. And so um, what happens when we uh, call with an incorrect number of arguments? For instance, we call it with no arguments. That's going to be a send of m. And that when we look up m, we're going to find a bridge method that basically raises an argument error. So that's basically how we. Um, dealt with that, that uh, issue there. We, just, we, we could have done something else by passing number of args to the stack or, or the number of other ways we could have approached that, but this had the virtue of lining up well with the small talk, not imposing a runtime cost on small talk and still dealing with all things. Plus we had a, a nice way of dealing with implicit, implicit blocks and, and splat args. Um, there are a lot of other things we overcame too uh, that I don't have time to go into any details on. For instance, uh, Ruby and Smalltalk coexist. Inside the VM, there are different what are called environments. So we can have a set of Smalltalk that Smalltalk doesn't even know about Ruby. You can, there's a little bit of explicit <coughs> syntax if you want to call it into Ruby, but all the Smalltalk classes and hierarchies and methods, they're all in this pristine environment over here. We have a whole other environment that we have the Ruby code in. And that allows us to mess with the inheritance hierarchy when we need to. We can override methods and not mess up with the Smalltalk thing. So Smalltalk can run well and we can call over onto the small talk side if we need to. Uh, there are dynamic instance variables in Ruby. Ruby allows you to, in small talk, the class defines the set of instance variables that every single object carries with it. And we can pre-calculate those and load those up front. But in uh, uh, Ruby, instance variables are allocated and, and come into existence dynamically as a side effect of running the methods. So we have, we have a, a a little bit of a runtime cost on that, but uh, we were able to implement that. We've gone through three parsers. So we started off with the MRI parser, then we went off with Ryan Davis's uh, Ruby parser. It was a pure Ruby parser, that was a little bit slow, and now we're um, onto a C based parser. There's some issues with blocks, props, and lambdas, because Smallpox only has the one concept, and Ruby has three. Uh, we added a few, few bytecodes, and there's a whole the singleton class is looking like meta classes led us down the wrong path for a while. 
But anyway, that's about all the time I have for that, so I think I will uh, open up for any questions. Yeah? On the bridge method, can you go back a couple of slides? Uh, which slide do you want? The one that had the, 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 the three bridge methods. Oh, the three bridge methods? Yeah. Uh, this one. Yeah. So the middle one, uh, I guess you're putting the, in the, the single argument case, you're pushing nil, right? On, uh, on so the, yeah, the question is, what are we pushing for that fifth <laughs> argument? Yeah. Uh, what happens is we're, we simply need to allocate the space because that the default parameter is b equals 10. That check for nil in that spot is done by in the preamble to the target right. method. Right, it, it, it may differ depending on at what method you actually get. Yes, right. yeah. So that, 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 that checks for that and then says, oh yeah, it is a nil. It's our secret marker value. Yeah. And then we can, then the preamble there will put in value 10 and move on. Yeah. Your call site caches, you're actually using Ruby hashes for that? Or? No, I was just using that as a, okay. as a it seems like oh, it's certainly not Ruby like the old, the small talk association objects there too to get some aliasing on that and get some, you know. Well, we're, we're, not, we're not even using small talk uh, things. Well, I mean, that, that kind of idea. Oh, the yeah. The idea of an association object. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's done in C in, inside the VM. Yeah. So. Yeah. So do you create the separate bridge methods for every Ruby method, or is it only if there is an optional, optional parameter there? Uh, no, it, we have to create them even if there's if there, if there a fixed thing, because you, you can still invoke the method with any number of arguments you want. Okay. And we only go up to three colons, and then at that point we throw up our hands, we stuff everything in an array, and on the other side we unpack that array, so you can pass as many arguments as you want. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks, guys.